Welcome into another episode of Suds with Luds podcast. And uh, right off the hop, I want to thank our partners in Herman Marshall Whiskey and Early Bird Gummies. Um, my guest is already smiling and laughing <laughs> next to me. <laughs> and we haven't even taken it yet. Yeah, I, well, not yet. Um, and let me introduce them. Um, longtime NHLer. Hard ass, um, Al Secord, Boston Bruins, Chicago Blackhawks, Toronto Maple Leafs, Philly. Yep. Talk about some teams that you played for. Yeah. Um, but first off, Al, I, I appreciate you coming in. I know it's a it's a long drive, and uh, but I know you're going for a skate at noon today. You're skating at noon today. I'm skating at uh, tonight, and then we are going to play in an alumni game, which we'll talk about later against the New York Rangers coming yeah. up. So. Um, Again, thanks for coming in here. And as you can tell, yeah, I, I have. It, it's ironic that my my partners or sponsors are as a whiskey company and a gummy bear or gummy <laughs> company in Early Bird and Herman Marshall. Very, very fitting. For yeah. You. So yes. if you have any problems sleeping or <laughs> anything, you know where to come to. All right, we, I'll talk we to you. We take care of our guests. So, <laughs> Al, I want to start with you. Um, you were badass when you played, and 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 not only that, but you scored goals and. And you came and you came into the league. I, I saw where you put. You're from Sudbury, Ontario, correct? Right. That's where I was born. But You're actually, born I was uh, raised in a little town uh, 50 miles away, 5,500 people, uh, Espanola, Ontario. So is that between Sudbury and Toronto, or would uh, it be the other north south? That's more between uh, Sudbury and Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Okay. Yeah. So heading west. Because I looked where you played junior. You played yeah. in Hamilton, right? I, I mean, did. Hamilton. The Finn Cups? They're called the Finn Cups. Our owners uh, were real estate guys in Hamilton, Finocchio Capito, so they took the name, have it, uh, Finn Cups. Okay. Yeah. So um, that being said, I, you know, one of the teams you played for was Toronto, and I was going to uh, – we'll get into that a little bit later. I want to know if that was kind of like a little bit of a homecoming when you played in Toronto, kind of home team kind of thing. But where I want to start today with you – and it made me think, I mean, you know, we're recording this on Wednesday, uh, Monday Night Football. Yes. And, um, you know, there was a there was an incident that happened. DeMar Hamlin of the Buffalo Bills uh, basically stepped up to lay a hit on uh, one of the Cincinnati Bengals. And so uh, ultimately his heart stopped right. and they resuscitated and, and did all the things that they did in a timely fashion. And it got me okay. thinking, um, you know, when we played – things happen and I was kind of going back man I don't know if I've ever had anything like that that I was part of in a game I do remember Clinton Larchuk he yes. got a skate across the juggler right juggler yeah, in Buffalo in Buffalo yeah, yeah. um there was uh Uri Fisher defenseman in Detroit his heart stopped they brought up the paddles and then right. just close to home here was Rich Peverly right um same thing happened and those are the only three that I remember was there anything like that in your career that that you had anything that resembled that? Uh, not for me personally. I remember uh, Mark Howe in Philadelphia when he went into the uh, bottom of the net. I don't know if you remember, the bottom had kind of a U-shaped metal at the bottom, and Mark slid into the uh, net and actually split him open from behind and required surgery. That was that was pretty bad. Did he hit his head or no? The uh, actually the, uh, the the metal part of the U-shaped at the bottom of the net went uh, more into his butt area oh, oh. and split him wide open. Oh, that's what you mean by yeah. split him, split him wider than what it already is split? Yes. Oh, no. Yeah, it was, no, it was, I didn't it know was that. Terrible. Yeah, that was, that was a bad one. That's the yeah. one that I remember uh, the most. And, uh, yeah, very tragic about the football player. I was working, and uh, <clears throat> I didn't see a highlight till yesterday, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, didn't, it didn't look that uh, out of norm, I thought, for a football right. game. But, you know, we're all built a little bit different. And uh, uh, for that to happen, very sad and tragic. He's getting a lot of press on it. And, yep. you know, we all hope that he, he recovers and well, he comes it, out of this. And when you say press, <laughs> it, I, I was listening to a bunch of the, you know, the, the, the reporters and, you know, the guys on ESPN and stuff like that. And it got into the Players Association and, and, and about, you know, taking care of players and stuff like that. Right. And, and we played, and you started before I did, but we played in the day where there wasn't a lot of – uh, it didn't seem like there was a lot of thought of post-career stuff, you know, and, no. and, and as far as taking care of the players. And, and I know, I mean, man, when I heard that Gordie Howe, like if it, his pension would be something like $7,000 a year right now, mm -hmm. it, it's it's crazy. And, and, and it doesn't, 
it really didn't even register. I mean, over the last few years, you know, you start thinking about it a little bit more. Um, but did any of that ever enter your mind? You know, did, did, did you ever get involved in any of the player, uh, you know, the meetings and things like that? When uh, you were a I, I did a little bit. Um, um, mostly a listener. Um, probably the best reps we had were Mike Milbury and Terry O'Reilly. He went to when Al Eagleson was running the yeah. show. And, you know, there was a lot of controversy there. In oh, fact, yeah. a, a big book written about it. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was players, uh, you know, get injured and dental and uh, all kinds of injuries after you walk out, shoulders, knees, you name it, uh, mental health, mm -hmm. uh, alcoholism sometimes, sometimes drugs, not so much in our day. But, uh, yeah, players taking, player, taking care of players, and you look at our alumni associations, and that's where we basically fall back on uh, for us as to uh, go to the alumni and – Places like here uh, in Dallas, in Chicago, Philadelphia, the ones that I've been associated with, Toronto, they've all uh, taken care of the older guys and their families and their kids for school, medical bills. Uh, I think a lot of it happens on the side that nobody knows about it, but I think it's basically the, uh, the strong alumni that has uh, reached back and, and taken yeah. care of these older guys. Yeah, you know, I, I, did, a, I did a podcast here uh, three, four weeks ago, Glenn Healy. Mm -hmm. And Heels, as you know, has kind of taken over yes. uh, that side of things. And I just think he's done an incredible job he has. in the last five or six years. Yep. I mean, you know, I mean, now there's a there's some sort of a kind of a pension when you hit 64 for players that played between 82 and 87 or something like right. that. Right. Uh, I'm not familiar with exactly what it is, but, yep. you know, just those kind of things. And what he's done as far as autograph cards and things like that, you know, trying trying to get some money in the pockets of some of the guys, sure. especially the guys that you know, played back in the day, Sure. you know, so sure. he's done a great job. Um, so let's, let's start um, with your, your, your junior days. And, and, you know, you came out of junior, you played three years there. Uh, the first thing that stuck out to me, I think it was your second year, you had 300 and some PIMS and like, I don't know, 30 or 40 goals in there. So right. I, I'm guessing you were that player in junior that you played as a, as a pro for 770 games or something. Right, right. Um, well, junior, I, I thought was the most vicious league I'd ever played in uh, back really? in the day. Yeah, really. There are training camps in our games, our bench clearing brawls. It was it was more of that. <laughs> and I, I remember my first two training camps, uh, first and second year, and they were absolutely brutal. I mean, bench clearing brawl after bench clearing brawl. Uh, you know, in a day you'd have f five or six fights. So your first uh, year playing junior, did yeah. you expect that going in, or did, was it like did not? Okay, did not. Uh, we had a guy named Bert Templeton who yeah. was uh, well known for his uh, uh, <laughs> having tough teams. Uh -huh. And uh, my first or second shift of the uh, scrimmages, they sent sent out this guy named Ronnie Roscoe, who uh, looked like he just came out of prison, <laughs> and uh, he had the big Fu Manchu mustache and the beard and uh, the old Stan Makita helmet and. All you can see is these slitty eyes and one eyebrow. And uh, Bert sent him after me uh, not only once, but two or three times. Really? And I guess he wanted to test and see if I could, uh, yeah. you know, take the heat and then continue to play. And uh, I, don't, I don't remember doing well in those fights. I mean, I was 16 years old. This guy's 19 or 20. It's like a boy fighting a man. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, as far as the strength and, and uh, experience. But uh, survived, and uh, either you, you show up and, and make it happen or you don't. So did you so, did you have any experience fighting prior to going to junior, or did you do anything in the off season to prepare yourself? Not really, not really. Um, <clears throat> junior B, or tier two, junior A, and uh, junior B the, the years prior, there was some fighting, but nothing like major junior A. Did you did you hear yeah. about it going into major? I mean, did you kind of know, or was it just all not, of a sudden happened? Not really, just all of a sudden happened. Yeah, and, <clears throat> and of course, um, I was a bigger kid. Uh, as a young teenager, so I was always playing with bigger guys. So I, I was glad that I had that experience that I was able to adjust right. to the size and the speed. And I didn't have uh, all the coordination in the world, but I had the size which helped me stay in the game and be able to protect myself and, and fight back and make my way onto the, into the uh, roster. So you get you play three <clears throat> years, you won a Memorial Cup, mm -hmm. right? Um, your reputation is there, right? You're, you're a play, you scored goals. You had the toughness. Right. You went 16th overall right. to the Boston Bruins. It just seems yeah. like it was such a, an appropriate team to, to draft you. Yeah, it, it was, it's funny. Um, uh, Detroit, Montreal, and Buffalo had actually contacted me before the draft to ask if I was interested. They sent me letters. 
and nothing from Boston, nothing from anywhere else. Uh, I didn't know where I was going to go in the draft. Of course, we didn't have the social media. There wasn't talk about it? Like, well, not, not really. Not like not today. Not I mean, like there's today. stuff that goes on yeah. today. I mean, day one. You know, we weren't really assessed uh, or scrutinized like they, like they are today. And uh, when Buffalo and Detroit and Montreal passed me the draft, I'm like, oh, man, am I, I, mean, am, am I going to get drafted? Yeah. I had no idea. And then all of a sudden, Boston. And uh, it's funny, as soon as I was drafted, I remember watching a clip on Johnny Winsink, who's one of the toughest, craziest guys in the league of all time yes. with the Bruins, uh, walking up to the Minnesota bench and challenging the whole <laughs> yes, bench. Yes, yes. And I'm thinking, okay, now i got to fight Winsink. i got to fight Jonathan. <laughs> Stan Jonathan, Terry Cashman, O'Reilly. i fight Terry O'Reilly, Dennis O'Brien. I mean, they had you know six, seven guys that were, that were really tough. So I thought, okay, well... I was used to these junior camps. Here we go again. Did that happen when you your first camp? Actually, it didn't. Um, I got sent to the uh, rookie camp for the first two weeks. Um, actually, that was was pretty vicious as well. We played games against the Islanders and the Flyers. Yeah. Uh, rookies. Now, at the time, were they the Broad Street Bullies still? Yes. They were in the heyday there, right? Oh, absolutely. Right yeah. in the middle of it. Yeah. So, of course, all their... Uh, Trying to find a nice word for these guys that should have been in prison as well. Uh, you know, we played these games and and they were crazy. Yeah, absolutely nuts. And the thing is, back then, you know, we'd play a game on say on a Saturday night, and the next afternoon play them again, and we're all beat up, banged up, stitches, and then and then do it again. Yeah, you know. Yep. And uh, so I get to the uh, main Bruin camp two weeks later. Of course, I've got a couple of weeks under my belt of skating and fighting and playing, and. Uh, Back in the day, camps were well a couple of weeks long, right? Right. So, but the first day of the main camp with the regular Bruin guys, that was their first skate. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, back then people came to camp to get in shape. They didn't come to camp Correct. in shape. So Mike Milbury skates up to me and says, uh, hey, uh, rookie. And I go, yeah. He says, if you do anything out here at all, he says, we will hit you over the head. With our stick. So your reputation preceded you coming there. They all knew. They all knew. Over. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I guess they were talking that, I mean, Don Cherry was watching our games. Okay. He was watching our camps. He saw what was going on. And so I said, fine with me. I'll yeah. just, you know, I just want to, I just want to be one of the guys. I want to break in. I want to make my way on the yeah. team, do my best. So, uh, so it's pretty comp camp. You can kind of see the speed's not quite there yet. And then uh, Cashman and Milbury get into a, a stick fight like Barney, uh, Barney Rubble and Fred Flintstone. With each other. With each other. Yeah. And they had the old little Jaffa helmets on. Yeah. And they're and they're hitting each other over the head. Stick <laughs> fight. <laughs> and they go, oh, here we go. Miller again. didn't take a skate off or a shoe and hit him in the head with not, a shoe. No, not yet. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that came later. Yeah. Yeah, that came later in New York. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so that was my introduction to uh, the Bruins camps, uh, rookie camps, as well as uh, um, <clears throat> the main camp. And then we slowly worked into uh, you know, drills and and also, Derek uh, Derek Sandin was there too. That was uh, uh, that was one of his recovery yeah. um, comebacks, and so that was kind of cool. Um, I, I basically had everybody's hockey card in my uh, in my suitcase yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that I've been watched for years, and now I'm skating with them. So that was that was quite a thrill. So you get into the regular season. Who, who who's your line mates? Because uh, you broke in. What would you get? Twenty goals. 15, 20 goals your, your rookie year. I think so. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I played a lot with uh, Peter McNabb. Uh, have Terry, Terry O'Reilly on the right side. You did okay. I was going to yeah. ask you if you had to play against Terry. At least you had yeah. one of the guys. Yes, there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, mostly uh, Peter McNabb. I was basically fourth line winger. I was competing with uh, uh, Johnny Winsick and Stan Jonathan and Donnie Marcotte and Wayne Cashman. So uh, I was usually uh, Winsick and I that were uh, inserted into the lineups. You know, we got our, our minimal ice time, and of course they sent Johnny and I out when it was required. Uh-huh. to uh, shake things up if the yep. game wasn't going well, get the crowd in the game, uh, maybe get a few hits, get in a fight, and, uh, and it worked well. We had a great team that year. So, But then you get – now, was that your whole year? I mean, did, was that part of your MO, the, your whole rookie year? I know yes. it was part of your MO over yeah. your career. Yeah. But all of a sudden, did they recognize this kid can score goals? Yeah, I, I think so. Because you were 20 um, years old, weren't you? When you didn't yeah, you make, I, was, I was 20 you were, years you're old. You were 20 years old. Right, I was 20 years old. Um, I did, as somebody just sent me this. They said I had the uh, seventh best shooting average in the league that year, percentage-wise, for number of shots. I didn't even shifts. know they kept those kind of stats. Yeah, there. yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. 
So I thought, uh, uh, you know, I, I obviously when I got to play, I, I created opportunities and was able to score a few goals. Mm -hmm. And I think for the amount of ice time that I did receive uh, in that first year, that, that it was very successful. Well, which was about what? What were you getting? Seven, eight, ten? Or, or were you more well, we didn't we didn't go by minutes at that time. Mm -hmm. I would say four shifts. Five four shifts sh a period? Five shifts a game. A game? A game, yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe well, a no wonder you have such a good shooting percentage. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so you know, you get. Uh, I'll say, um, I'll say maybe nine, maybe two, three shifts a, a period, maybe. Yeah. So, so but, well, who was your first NHL fight then? Do you uh, Kurt Bennett. Never heard of him. Played for the St. Louis Blues. He had, uh, I think, two other brothers. Uh, one that I played with in Chicago. He was like six six two oh. twenty two twenty five. And uh, he was the first guy that kind of gave me a rough time yeah. in my first game, uh, first exhibition game, actually. And, uh, yeah, big fella. Big fella. I did it right. I didn't lose. <laughs> well, well, so would you consider yourself, as, when, when you had to fight, were you a strategic fighter? Like, you know, in, instead of just standing back and throwing. And the reason I, I bring that up, obviously, I, I've seen some of your fights I was watching. <laughs> yeah. We couldn't get into the Dino thing later. But... <laughs> <Okay. real. clears throat> um, but and, and the reason I think of it, and because I, I watched fight with Clark Gillies yeah. and Proby, yeah. right? Two big dudes. Yeah. And in, when I was watching that, you reminded me a lot of a guy that I played with, Chris Nyland. And I don't know sure. if you ever fought Nux or not, but Nux always times. seemed like he wanted to fight from the inside. Yeah. Right? Well, um, <clears throat> it's funny. Um, I guess because of the TV and the coverage and the out-of-town games, a lot of times were not televised. But my my best fights were in the beginning. I was boxing at that time in the off-season. Okay. And I was more of a stand-up fighter. I, I think what I tried to do was uh, feign guys into throwing the first punch. And when, when they throw and they were a little overextended, then I was a better counter puncher. And um, uh, most of my most of my <laughs> best fights are not even on YouTube or not anywhere. They're probably some archive somewhere in black and white. Yeah, <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah I know. <laughs> but but uh, as the years went on, uh, you know, sometimes you look back on how you would change things. And when I was boxing, I was fighting really well. I didn't think I was a great fighter. Um, uh, but I stopped, I stopped the boxing. I did focus more on the off ice conditioning. I think I should have kind of grew with the game, grew with the fighters because they were getting bigger. They were getting better. They were a little more strategic and I did not do that. So I found that my fighting in the end of my career was more, more of a grappling and hanging on and, you know, trying yeah. to get, uh, you know, smaller opportunities instead of just toe to toe, like I used to go and be able to know fast hands and, and and move and counter so uh yeah that it, was that was my own fault for not really pursuing it a little bit well it's kind of what i what i noticed in the fight against gillies you yeah. know because i mean again well, big man you know well, i mean well, i'll tell you about that fight with gillies we had played against the islanders that was the first year that they started their their uh the their cup, run the four run yeah cup and uh terry o'reilly had fought gillies three or four times and poor poor taz he he uh I mean, Gillies is a big man. He puts his hands up in front of you. You can't even see his face. All you see is two <laughs> boulders. Um, and Taz had taken, uh, you know, a couple of good shots. So I thought, you know, I better step in here and try to help him out. And uh, I, if you watch the video, I gave him a little slap in the face, which is, you know, very insulting. Yes. And then I see these two boulders come up. I can't see his face anymore. I go, oh, here we go. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, I, I didn't really get hit by him. But uh, I remember he ended up on top of me, and I tried to get up and pick him up and uh, you know he's got away I don't know 225 230 oh, yeah. and my, my niece snapped a little bit and I went okay I think I just better stay down here and let the referee pull him off yeah <laughs> so, I ain't yeah. no dummy <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah he was he was one of the bigger guys and uh, uh, I've seen some of his interviews and um, uh, he, he sounded like a really great guy yeah. oh awesome captain unreal him and Nystrom I guess were tight and uh you know, he talks about a story about fighting Ben Wilson a couple of times yeah. where one, he didn't do so well, and he came back into Chicago. And Nystrom says, you know, you got to do this. Yeah. You know, you got to do this. Yeah. And he went after Ben, and he actually uh, he did pretty good yeah. that last time. Well, I tell you, Clarky, and you're right, he was an incredible man yeah. and ultimate teammate. I, I hear guys talk about him, and I, you know, I spent some time there. Yeah. But I remember I had a little – well, I didn't have anything with that with Clarky. I was – 
I don't know if it was my second, third year, whatever it was in Montreal. And, you know, when I started, they were like, hey, you got you to be physical and you got to do this kind of stuff. And I right. can't remember if it was on the island or not, but it was at a whistle, at a face-off. <laughs> and, and I had, I, I don't know even who I hit, but Clark, he came on the ice and, you know, he skated right up to me on the face-off, right? And all he said to me is, he goes, I, I think he said, kid, you want to, you, 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 what did he say? You want to get your ears wet or something like that? You want to get wet behind the ears or something like that? And I knew what he meant. And I said, not really. <laughs> and, he, not really. and he goes, stop running around then. Yeah. I said, okay. And that's okay. all it was. Yes, sir. Yes, and it was yes, like, sir. go about my yeah. business. Yes, Do that next game. Gillies isn't on that team. So, um, and then before, uh, before we get to, you know, you going from Boston to Chicago, uh, the, the Probert fight. Mm-hmm. And and the one that I saw, and, and you frustrated the shit out of him, right? You know, because he kind of did the same thing. He couldn't. He was trying to, yeah. You know, pound you. He was doing the Barney rubble on the back of your head, and at the end of it, it looked like he 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 tried to headbutt headbutt you, and then he that, tried to knee you. That's because I had tried to headbutt him first. Oh, is that what? Okay, <laughs> I didn't happened, see yeah. that part. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, how do you remember? Because I didn't I didn't even look at the year. That particular fight, how how long had Probert been in the league at that time? Uh, maybe a year or two. Okay, so uh, did you know anything about him, or did you I, play I, against him in junior or anything no, like that? No, nothing like that. He's he's well before me, but we had played Chicago, Detroit in Windsor uh, exhibition game, and he was out there, and I was I was in the prime of my life. I was cocky. I didn't care who I fought. You know, sure. just doing my thing, and I remember going up and cross checking him. And uh, he didn't move. <laughs> and I went, okay, this kid's pretty solid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. So we didn't fight that time. But that fight you're talking about, um, one thing about Probert is if you notice in his fights, um, he, he, he could battle right away or he could hang on to you for a long time. Yeah. And the guys would get tired. And then once they were tired and he started unleashing. Well would, conditioned and he was just he, got he loose. He destroyed a lot of guys. Yeah, yeah. So... You didn't realize, in, prior to that fight, I had fought Kosher twice in that same game. So that was my third fight. Uh-huh. So when I got to him, um, I don't think I was as fresh as a daisy. Yeah. And uh, so when we got in that fight, there was a lot of holding on. But that's where my off-ice conditioning really kicked in, that I was able to yeah. uh, match him and his strength. The endurance and, was your, your strength right. almost. I, you know, I did not allow him to break free and then kick yeah. the crap out of me. So. Yeah. Well, you definitely yeah. frustrated. I can tell at the end of it yeah. where you frustrated him. Yeah, and I was frustrated too because I couldn't, I couldn't break from him either. So, yeah. Because he was pretty, pretty strong. Yeah. He's, he's a big guy. So you have a... a a couple of good years there in Boston, your first couple of years, and then you get moved to Chicago, which, yes. how did you take that? Because did you look, let me, let me start. Did you have a favorite team growing up? Like coming I, I, up? I did. Montreal Canadiens. It was. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't like you got traded away from your favorite team being the Boston Bruins or anything like no, that. No, but, but I tell you what happens. Uh, I mean, we're, you know, emotional people mm-hmm. and uh, I was, I'm, I think I'm a very loyal guy yeah. uh, to my team. So I thought Boston was like it forever. I get into a team, the average age is 28, which was considered old. I'm a 20 year old. These guys take me under the wing. They take great care of me. Yeah. Very tight team. Uh, make a lot of friendships, and uh, due to the uh, uh, the way hockey works back then, as far as contracts, money, mm-hmm. option year, uh, there was a lot of underlying stuff that was going on. So when I got traded to Chicago, I was I was heartbroken. You were. I was absolutely devastated. Yeah, and it was during the season, right? It was during. Uh, right, was yes. that right before Christmas? It was December twentieth, nineteen eighty. See, I'll never forget that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I get traded to Chicago. Uh, in fact, uh, I had had a meeting with Harry Sinden in my option year. Uh, he called me into his office and basically uh, dressed me down as far as how bad I was playing and wasn't doing this. And uh, I'd never just re- really disrespected an adult before. And I said, Harry, I said, uh, you are absolutely wrong. Kind of like, go F yourself. Yeah. And uh, what you're saying is not the truth. So he throws me out of his office. I get sent down to the uh, Springfield Indians, uh-huh. for the American Hockey League. Uh, very upset about that, and uh, I remember creating a little havoc down there. I was going to say, who did you take it I out was, on? I was angry. Yeah. And yeah. then I get traded to Chicago, uh, I think about two and a half weeks after that. So, uh, you know, it's funny when you fly into visiting teams, you never really look out the window of the airplane. Yeah. But landing in Chicago, I remember saying, wow, this this is a, a huge place. It's big, and 
I guess, a new start. Uh, you know, I got to start changing my thinking and, and start thinking about what my job is to stay on the Chicago Blackhawks. And I was fortunate that I had Keith Magnuson and Cliff Coral as my coaches. And Keith Magnuson and Cliffy, uh, they were so welcoming. Uh, they met me at the airport. <clears throat> they could tell that I was uh, pretty upset about the whole thing. And uh, they, they made it work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they went above and beyond, made it work. Um, I was dating a girl in Boston at that time. And one of our first games was in New York City. And they allowed me to bring my girlfriend in and uh, at least have somebody around that was, you know, somewhat close yeah. and go for dinner. And yeah. I didn't have a curfew. And uh, they, they, they just uh, they just made sure that I was welcome and, and brought me into the uh, Chicago Blackhawk organization. Well, you rewarded them way. with yeah. your, I mean, where, yeah. did, where did it, how do I put this? Where, where did, you didn't get away from the physical fighting and stuff like that, but you no. became a goal scorer. Yeah, well, um, I mean, did it bother you in Boston that you didn't get enough recognition for what you could do offensively goals wise? And it was not, more about not really, no. not really, because we were a team and uh, the point was two, two points, a win, you know, yeah. not, nothing else. So yeah. whatever it took, I, I didn't yeah. really care. Um, I get to Chicago. And like you said, if you look at my stats in Boston for the amount of ice time yeah. and the number of shots versus goals, uh, I, I think I, I did a good job there. Yeah as well as the physicality. And, of course, going into the um, NHL, my, my dad told me, he says, hey, you, you know, you're not the most gifted hands. You're not the best skater. Uh, you're fortunate that you're big enough that you can play physical. You got the mentality. He said, that's, that's your game. Mm -hmm. He said, you play that game, everything else is bonus after that. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, do what you're supposed to do. Don't become civilized and, and wreak <laughs> havoc out there. <laughs> and, and you're going to... It was great advice, right? <laughs> well, it was. It was. Yeah. Uh, it just told me who I was and who I was supposed to be. And uh, lucky for me, I was uh, uh, introduced to uh, uh, a professional hockey school up in London. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of the name of it right now. Uh, oh, Huron Hockey School. So, Paris Keon? Huron. Oh, Huron. Huron. Huron Hockey School. Huron. Yeah. It was oh, okay. Up north of London. Because uh, Toronto has a Harris Keon Hockey School when I was younger. And oh, I, yeah, I went you're to. right. Yeah. You're right. Okay. Yeah. Well, this was kind of a, probably one of the first pro uh, hockey camps. Oh, uh, it's for NHLers. For NHLers. Oh, okay. And, and American League and International League guys. And uh, that's when the uh, kind of the Russian circuit training was around. And they had brought that into the camp. So I learned from them how to off-ice train better, more sports-specific. And after one summer of that, I went from um, a more confident player, a stronger player, a more explosive player. I was still boxing. So when I hit my stride in 82, 83, that was due to the off-ice training, um, the boxing, and, of course, uh, you know, hitting your stride in your mid-20s. And that's where the goal scoring came. And then they put me with a guy named Dennis Savard. Oh, yeah. Tim Higgins and, and Steve Larmer were my two right wingers. And that's where, uh, you know, there's that whole... The chemistry uh, kind of came together with that group. of our different uh, assets that we brought to sure. the game uh, made us successful. Yeah. Successful, excuse me. Well, you know, and again, when you talk about the, the hockey camp, so-called hockey camp, there yeah. were no skills thing. Like today, everything is skills, right? right. And that's all they right. seem to work on. Right. That was never a thing, was it? Right. There was no. never really no. any of that. You no, it was, it was basically, uh, uh, I, th I think for years and years, we just did kind of what we were told yeah. and really didn't work on individual things. Right. And, uh, and again, lucky for me that I was introduced to that off-ice training, which just enhanced my skills. Yeah, yeah but I can't imagine what the sticks today and the amount of individual work that goes on, how good we could have really been. Yeah, it's incredible. And, yeah. you know, and these kids, and again, we could talk about the difference in styles and games when we played versus mm -hmm. what we watch now. Right. You know, it's exciting. I mean, it really is, but we, we missed that other side of the game. We did. Right? We did. Yeah. Uh, although, you know, I've watched some of the uh, mid-'80s, uh, like Norris Division rivals, St. Louis, Chicago, Toronto, uh, Minnesota, and you watch those games, and from the most skilled player to the least skilled player on the team, everybody finished their check yeah. for seven game series, you know, four series, and everybody hit. Uh, every, if you if you missed the check, it actually stood out. It did. Yeah. 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 So I I kind of missed that part of the game. Yeah. Watching it today, I I notice. 
if you listen to the guys uh, working in the corners, all you hear is tick, 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 tick. It's all stick it's clacking, it fighting for sticks, yep. where you don't hear that big body bang and the crowd getting into it and cheering and, and you know, uh, loving it. <clears throat> so I, I think that part of the game is is, is missing. And uh, to be honest with you, and, you know, with coaching a U18 team, uh, we have a triple A team here, you know, that we travel around the country with these kids. It's hard to sell that, that yeah. part of the game too, right? right? Because right. what they watch they actually watch YouTube and they watch the YouTube clips. They watch the highlights of the, the best players in the game, right? Yes. And it's hard to tell, you know, a 17, 18 year old, 16 year old to say, that's not who you're going to be, you know, because they, and you don't want to put them down. Right. But if you're going to make it to the next level, because you're not 12, 13 now, you're 17, 18. Right. You're kind of becoming who you are. Not that you're not going to improve, but this is probably the role that you're going to play. You know, there are other special guys, right. but they watch. That between the they watch the Zegras, you know, with the Michigan, they watch all those kind of things, and they and they can do it in practice. Yeah. I mean, they the kids can, yeah. but it's hard to sell them on the complete game, the, the foundation, your base. You got to have that foundation, yes. right? Yeah. And the game hasn't changed that much. That foundation still got to be there. It exactly. Yeah. So now you're in Chicago. You got some good guys you're playing with. Mm -hmm. um, I think I, I saw where you were one of the only guys to. What was it? Score 40, 40 plus 44 goals in yeah. 2000. Or no, what was it? 300 minutes. Oh, 303 minutes. You had 303 minutes in a year and 44 goals. Yeah. The only guy to ever do that. Right. So you didn't lose that part of the game. No. Right? But but the offensive side came, and then you end up playing in a couple All-Star games. Right. Yep. Which, did, did that surprise you? Did you already know the, that was always there? Um, that was actually very surprising. Yeah. Um, I think that one, the first one, uh, first year that I went, um, you know, play again, playing with Savard and Larmer, I, I think we had, uh, we were leading the league as a line, point, uh, goals and, and assists. And I had 20 goals in 20 games, of course, mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of help. And uh, so Speaking I think of Steve Larmer, should he be in the Hall of Fame? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a lot yes. of talk about yeah. him and JR, guys like that. I was just curious. I mean, you played yeah. with the guy. You know exactly what he did. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I, I mean, it was always amazing to me that I don't know if, he, if Steve can do 10 push-ups. <laughs> but but he had the record for longevity. Yeah, you know, playing that many games yeah. in a row, and I think it was he had a little tiff with uh, Daryl Sutter, and Sutter stopped the streak. Uh huh. Uh, I think the reason Sutter did it was to get his mind off of the streak and focus more on his game. I guess sure. he wasn't happy with his play at that right. time. Right. But he was towards the end of his career. But he did win a cup in New York. Yeah. After that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, Steve Larm was an awesome player. Very unassuming. Uh, but his, his skill level is way up there that yeah. people didn't realize. So th this is where you became that, I would say, that coveted type of player at the time, right? Yeah. The guy that can score goals, that can do the dirty work, yeah. and all this other kind of stuff. A couple of all-star games. And I, I just think of the the jerseys so far in your young career. You put on a yeah. Boston Bruin jersey. And Boston then Black. It, yeah. Chicago it, Red. It, I mean, it, it's just unreal, isn't Toronto it? Toronto Blue. I, you got to kind of yeah. be living... Yeah. A dream from even even what went down in Boston. Now you're yep. in Chicago, and just speaking of Chicago, before I move on to Toronto, um, one last shift, is there, or is it one oh, yeah. more shift? Yeah, yeah. Tell me about that. Tell, talk about that. Well, uh, the Blackhawks had been asking me uh, for a long time to do that one last shift, and uh, I I really didn't want to do it. And then they made me an offer. Why didn't you want to do it? I don't know. Uh, I, I, I kind of felt like I had my time. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's just move on. Um, but uh, I didn't know if it was more of an honoring. Uh, I, was, I was kind of, was it an honoring thing or was it a PR thing? Was it both? Uh -huh. uh, and I, I don't know, I, I guess I just, I just didn't really want to do it. And, it. and the thing that turned the corner for me is they offered to bring my two boys with me. Right. Uh, I saw that interview. And spent a couple of days yeah. downtown. Yeah. And I thought, okay, what a great opportunity for father sons to get together. Yeah. They'll get to come in the uh, the United Center and watch the game. And just just too many great things for my boys to experience. So I finally decided to do mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And you, you enjoyed it? Oh, you, it was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, Blackhawks yeah. did a fantastic yeah. job. So. Yeah. And they need so. to improve on the, you know, <laughs> yeah. especially what's going on now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So... All right, then you go to Toronto, which I, yeah. I was wondering, was that more like, that's why I asked you earlier. I mean, did it seem like a homecoming? Is it something that, did you ever want to play for the Toronto Maple Leafs? Um, not really, but 
once I was traded, it never really crossed my mind. I thought, oh, great, you know, my family would be able to come down more. I have uh, quite a few cousins, aunts and uncles, grandparents in the area, so that'll be good for them uh, to come to the games. Um, I still wasn't that happy about getting traded from Chicago. Now I've sure. been there six and a half years and made friends, and I had a home and had a child at the time and didn't want to make that move. But, of course, that's the name of the game. Uh, I realized after the first time that you can't take it personally. It's just part of the business. Yeah. So I go, okay, now here I am going to Toronto. In fact, I was in my home in the uh, suburbs of Chicago, and the phone rang. And I had a bunch of people in my house were all going out for dinner. And uh, Bob Pulford says, uh, yeah, you, oh, we, we just traded you to uh, uh, Toronto. <laughs> you know. So I'm like, oh. Okay, thanks. That was, this was in the summer, right? Or yeah. was it? it this was wasn't during the season. It yeah, was okay. in the summer. I said, yeah, yeah okay. Uh, thanks, Bully. Yeah. Hung up. No, that was it. That was it. So, so my buddy goes, who was that? I said, Ball Pulfer, I just got traded to Toronto. Let's go for dinner. <laughs> so, oh, <laughs> what can you do, right? What can you do? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, but then it didn't, uh, that was in, uh, did I see it was in September? Uh, was it just it before was camp? Actually, it was, yeah, it was in August, I think. So you're getting ready right to go to camp then within a few right. weeks. Yeah, exactly. Go meet your new t- yeah. You and Eddie O, I think, wasn't it? You and yep. Eddie Olchuk went yeah, there? Yeah, Eddie Olchuk, uh, Kenny Remchuk. Yeah, yeah. Was there one more? No, I think there was three of us. Yeah, Eddie, Kenny, and myself. Yeah, there might have been one other guy. And Eddie, yeah, they got uh, Vive, Steve Thomas, and uh, Bob McGill. Went the, they went the other yeah. way. So there's Bob McGill, who I'd fought 15 times. Yeah. And uh, I'm thinking, okay, going to Toronto. And then I found out the train. I'm like, oh, crap, I got to now fight him in Chicago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, here we go. <laughs> well, how was Toronto? Like, how, did you enjoy I, playing there? Or? I did. I, I love the city of Toronto. Um, of course, love the people. It was nice being a little closer to home, like you said. Uh, but at that time, Howard Ballard was, I think, uh, really kind of going downhill yeah. uh, because of his age. Uh, I found that the club was uh, a little disorganized. Um, the press, I think, is very tough there on the oh, players. Boy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you think about it. I mean, we're, we're all in our 20s. We're human. And uh, we don't have that big wall of, uh, of you know, whatever abuse you throw us through the media that we're not going to take it to heart. So yeah. I, I found the press very tough on the players. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, so I realized I had to deal with that. And, of course, when you're reaching the end of your career and you're not doing as well as you used to, it can be even a little bit more uh-huh. uh, stress, you know. So you got to stop reading the newspaper, basically. Turn the radio off. But, um, yeah, I, I, I found that we were a little dysfunctional as a team. Everybody there wanted to win, wanted to do well, but there wasn't that much camaraderie because it was so dysfunctional that we just couldn't put it together. We, we did the best we could as individuals. Sure. And uh, a lot of great guys. Uh, Boris Salming, of course, yeah. he just passed away. Yeah. Uh, I sat beside uh, uh, beside Clark, and he, he was a hoot. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a funny guy, Ally Frady. Uh, we had a lot of great guys on that team. And uh, so, yeah, we just tried to do our very best with what we had, mm-hmm. and, you know, like we always do. And uh, But I did find it very dysfunctional. And I noticed after they changed management, they got other guys upstairs, uh, and, of course, uh, brought in a little bit more talent to the hockey team. Their organization seems to be on step yeah. now. And I yeah. actually, that's the team I root for now to yeah. win the Cup. It's, well, been, it's been so long. They, they're, you know, they say you have, to, you have to go through it to get to it, and you got to win before you know how to – or you got to lose before you learn how to win and all this other kind of stuff. Right. They've done their share of losing. <laughs> And yeah, I got a lot of relatives in pain up there. What, what so. a lot of hype every year. Yeah. Uh, and you talk about the fishbowl. I mean yeah. – it's tough for players to play there. I'm sure. I mean, I know what it was like playing in Montreal, yeah. but um, they've got a good they've got a good team now, mm-hmm. and and uh, I think they've got a good a goaltender that nobody really didn't know if that was the right move or not. And Murray right. bringing him in, he seems right. to be find his game. So they may be there at the end. I, I think yeah. they can be in. I don't know. Maybe they can be in the finals at least in the yeah. conference at the end. Yeah, well, I'm cheering for him. That's that's who I want. I think it's been long enough. I'd yeah. love to see success and. Yeah. Have my uh, relatives quit griping at me and complaining. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, then, so after Toronto, you make a little pit stop in Philly. Yep. You, you weren't there long, right? Yeah, a little story there. Uh-huh. I wasn't too happy in Chicago. They'd fired John Brophy, who I loved. Uh, wasn't the greatest coach in the world, but I, I just loved the guy. I he mean, he was like in Montreal great. my first year. Bro. Was he? Okay. Oh, geez. He's a character. A oh, oh yeah. my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I talk about old school. Yeah. So... 
But anyway, things weren't going well. They brought in, uh, uh, I'm sorry, who's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having in, a little in brain. In where, in Philly or? No, in Toronto. They brought in a coach at the end uh, who would played in like 1943 or something. <laughs> <laughs> George Armstrong. I know. I was just going to say, I, George I wouldn't know the name either, but I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. Yeah. Love George. Uh, yeah. great, a great human being. Uh, I think just a little out of touch, you know, for that time. But, sure. you know, he was, he tried to do the very best they could. Yeah. I wasn't playing. So I asked to be traded. They said no. So I said, hmm, if they're not going to ask, maybe I can make some phone calls. So I called Vancouver myself. I called, really? Yeah. I called Vancouver. I called Philly and I called Boston. And I was actually kind of negotiating between the three of them on my own. Did you have an agent? No. Okay. I did it myself. Okay. And then uh, Paul Holmgren was the uh, coach in Philadelphia, and he's finally made the deal because I wanted to get to a team who I thought had the best chance to get to a Stanley Cup. Yeah. So uh, Homer pulled me out of uh, Toronto, made the trade, got me to Philadelphia, and I got to play that last half season with him. So I was always grateful for him to, yeah. uh, to do that. And then and you go back. Then, then, um, then I'm a free agent. Uh -huh. And uh, as I told you, I, you know, I had a wife and a kid in Chicago because uh, you know, I'm all over the place. Yeah. And I wanted to go back and be with my kid. Sure. And uh, so I uh, talked to Pulford, came back. Actually, I turned down a two-year contract with the Flyers, came back for one year okay. with Chicago, and that ended up being my last year just so I could be closer to family and ended up playing the last year there. But so. then there's a pocket there. There's a pocket. It, it seemed to me like that was in 90. Yep. 94, you come back and play in the American League. Yeah. What, like, what did you do the four, the four years in between? I, well, I, that's, that's, when, that's when I got into my aviation okay. uh, a part. Uh, when I retired, I took like six months off, let the body heal. Um, I didn't realize how sore I was <laughs> for that time sure. and how long it took to for the body to get back where I could walk and not feel any pain. Um, and, but I'd met a, a gentleman uh, named uh, uh, Jerry Berdoulas in Philadelphia who worked for Raytheon Corporation. He was a pilot. And after I retired, he calls me up like, you know, six, literally six months later, says, hey, you, you still want to be a pilot? I'm like, well, yeah. Was this something you wanted to do like as a kid? I, I did. Okay. I did. And, but I didn't really have any connections. And, of course, people make a lot of promises to you and not yeah, follow yeah. through. So I, I, he actually made that promise, uh, you know, when I was playing for the Flyers. And, uh, but I'd forgotten. And, and he calls me uh, out in Vancouver and says, hey, you, you want to be a pilot? I said, yeah. So he helped me get introduced to the flying career. How old are you at the time? Uh, 33. And 33. the reason I ask that is because yeah. I had a roommate when I was in college, and he was, you know, 22, and he was learning how to be a pilot. Right. And, you know, it seems to me like the pilots all start learning that craft Right. At, in their 20s. Right. Well, I actually, I started flying in August of 81. Okay. So I was just a basic, uh, what they call VFR pilot, visual flight rules, uh, summertime flyer in the off seasons. I didn't have that much time, much experience, but I still had some ratings, yeah. uh, some licenses in my pockets. So that actually uh, kind of catapulted me a little quicker once I made that decision to pursue it. Yeah. But anyway, this... Uh, um, uh, so that's where I started the aviation career, and then <laughs> I ended up playing professional roller hockey. I know that's where I was going to go next. Like, okay. What the hell are yeah. you doing? Well, I was, I was, my weight was a little heavy, and this guy made an offer <laughs> that I could. This is more about conditioning. Yeah, it yeah. was. <laughs> so plus, he made an offer I couldn't refuse. In those leagues, you had to get them a, the cash up front because yeah. you didn't know when they were going to fold. And that was in Chicago, also, right? That was in Chicago. Yeah. So uh, I remember dropping. I dropped about I don't know 14 pounds playing in those hot rinks. Yeah. In the middle of the summertime. And Grant Mulvey was the uh, GM of the Chicago Wolves of the International Hockey League. So I guess he had gone to a couple of games because the, the rink that I played in was in Elmhurst, Illinois, which is where Grant Mulvey lived, and so did I. And he says, hey, you want to come up for the Wolves? Like, no, nah, no thanks, no thanks. So he, he was on me, on me. Finally, he made me an offer I couldn't refuse. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, okay, I'm going to go to camp. If I don't embarrass myself, I said, I'll play, but I'll, I'll just give it a try. And at that time, I had a, I had a broken toe and uh, skating with a broken toe in camp. And I'm 34 years old. And But it, it actually went quite well. Ended up playing uh, two more years. And then the body finally said, uh, that's enough. Uncle. Yeah, because uh, in those days, we used to play Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights with yeah. a little bit of travel between yeah. games. And I remember Sunday morning, 
I'd have to call somebody to help to get them to help me get out of bed. I couldn't move, mm-hmm. and the recovery time just wasn't there. Of course, being mid thirties, your body made so, the decision. But yeah, yeah. So that was it. When you decided to go back to the American League or to the American League after playing in the NHL of seven hundred and sixty six games, yeah. were there the young guys that wanted to try it? Oh on? yeah, yeah. So, oh, yeah. But, and you obviously had to know that coming in, right? Absolutely, yeah. And and that's what happened too, especially my second year. I was fighting these kids, 21, 22 years old. They're six four, six five. You fought, you fought a buddy of mine, Mick Vakota. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you fought well, Stir. Yeah. Well. Yeah. There's a story there. But yeah, these kids were you know two two twenty five plus. I mean, I fought one kid who was two sixty, and he was playing for Vegas. And I remember after the fight, we're skating to the box. He goes, Al, he says, I've got a hockey card in the dressing room. Will you sign up for me after? I'm like, man, you just Did you? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I met him after. We oh. talked. I shook my hand. He was, he was pleased. Well, so. I, I, and that's what, that was one of the reasons I, I looked at it. And I'm like, man, the dates can't be right. 90 and then 94, he goes to the American League. And I'm thinking, yeah. you've got to know these guys are all going to be knocking yeah. on your door. And, but yeah. you, you knew what you were getting Yeah. Into. So, well, yeah, I survived. I, I didn't take. I only took. Uh, uh, who was the kid that used to play for Montreal? Uh, he came from the International Hockey League, and he uh, actually was caught with doing steroids, and he ended up with cancer. Um, wasn't John? No, wasn't Johnny Cordick. Uh, no, no, no. I, I'll, I'll think of this guy. Uh, this guy's name probably after I this interview. But yeah. anyway, uh, we'd played three games in three nights. We're in Chicago. And uh, I played a million shifts, and this guy steps out on the ice, fresh as a daisy. He ends up being a tough guy for Montreal, and he dings. It's a fact that's the only game televised back to my hometown oh, in, no. in those two years. <laughs> so he dings about seven off my head. Uh, I'm, I'm exhausted. I fall down. Nothing happens. You know, I didn't get hurt, didn't take any shots. And uh, we're skating off the ice, and he yells over. He goes, L, I know you played three games in three nights. We'll do this again next week. I said, you're right. I'm, I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> so. How long did you, when did you put a helmet on? When did I? Yeah. Um, I had to for the International League. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, All so, right, I was going to say, but your NHL career? Well, the, I, I had to wear one. Well, I put one because on Because it was, wasn't the rule, if you came into the league before 79. Yes. Is that what it was? You didn't That's have to wear was. a helmet. Right. In the NHL. Right. And so, but did you that put it on? I did uh, not. You, ne- you never played an NHL game with a helmet? Uh, I did in the beginning because I'm coming out of junior. I put the helmet on. Okay. And then uh, Don Cherry, uh, we went to Toronto, of course. Uh, I had 30 people in the stands. Don Cherry says to me, he says, uh, if you take off your helmet, he says, I'll start you first shift and, and you get to play all the power plays. No way. Yeah. So, so I took the helmet <laughs> off. Great. So I took the helmet off. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, he wanted his team to look bigger and, and tougher because the guys do look bigger without the helmets. And they had like so, like my second shift, they ended up fighting uh, Dave Hutchison. Okay. And uh, Don Cherry tells a story. He was like, oh my gosh, this kid's going to get destroyed. His yeah. family's in the stands. I told him to take his helmet off. Yeah. I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, actually, that fight, fight went very well. That actually cemented my, my place on the yeah. team. And uh, you could see him. In the uh, YouTube video, we're standing on the bench, a big smile, clapping. And sure. That was it. So. so, okay, you talk about flying, being a pilot. Yep. Now you're with American Airlines. Yes. How, take, take us through that thing, how you, how you get from, from point A to point B. Now, talk about life, uh, career you know, after hockey, life after hockey. Now you're flying for America. And your wife also, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. she, she retired a year ago. Okay. Uh, yeah, she's done. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I tell you what happens. Uh, long story short is, again, I, I started flying in 81, August of 81, uh, didn't get serious till I was 33, uh, of course, with the help of that gentleman from Philadelphia. And uh, I was flying cargo out of Philly International in a twin engine, flying uh, cargo around like basically the Northeast. So I got some really good winter experience up there. Picked up 1,200 hours of flight time in a year and a quarter, which is a lot. Right. Yeah, a lot of good experience. Got scared a few times. And that uh, qualified me for a company called Great Lakes Aviation, which was a United Express carrier flying turboprops. It was a 19-passenger uh, uh, turboprop airplane. Uh, I get based out of uh, Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, which is like going to uh, northern Russia. Uh, <laughs> to a lot of people, nobody wanted to go up there. But we had a really uh, small base, uh, good guys, a lot of good flying, good experience. I get 4,500 hours uh, in five and a half years. 
which then um, I, I meet a gentleman in Chicago who is a 7-6 captain for American. Now, I had jump seated on all the airlines, meaning I traveled in their cockpits and in the back, and I'd met lots of crews. And uh, I found that the American guys always, uh, American pilots always treated me the best, mm -hmm. and they were the most fun uh, to, to be around. Sure. So uh, I only put in one application for American Airlines. Mm -hmm. Met the chief pilot in Chicago, did kind of a mini interview, found out later that he was one of my sponsors to get to the hiring process. And then from there, I had to prove myself um, in the interview process as well as the simulator. Um, <clears throat> and, then, uh, and then you go to school. Uh, See, I uh, started out 727 flight engineer, then I went to the Fokker 100, the uh, DC-9 Super 80, and now I'm on the 737-800. So how many years did it take you to become a pilot for American? Uh, it took me, actually, I see, 98, uh, doing the math. Well, it only took me about six years. Which six was years. Pretty quick. And how long have you been, fortunate. been flying with American now? Uh, I'm coming up on 25 years. 25 years. Yeah. So <clears throat> I was talking to Eddie, Eddie Belfour. Yeah. You know, Eddie's a pilot, and yep. Eddie was flying to, uh, this is, you know, it's funny, it happened a couple days prior to when we did the Belfour show, and I forgot to bring it up, <clears throat> but Eddie was telling me stories. He was flying to where he's going to be uh, hopefully putting his distillery up, yes. and I don't know if you talked to him about this at all, but everything went out on his plane <laughs> and lost all electricity and everything like that. Right. Right. And and he had to basically pull out the maps, and he had to put the landing gear and all this kind of stuff down on his own. Yeah. Um, and his cell phone wasn't working, and and apparently when he was going to land, he didn't land because he wasn't sure what was happening. But yeah. the guys on the ground knew that there was something wrong when he went back and forth two or three times. Knew okay. that he lost. He couldn't talk to the tower. He couldn't right. talk to anybody. Yeah. Have you ever had any uh, anything like that happen to you? In yes. Your... Uh, in my and part of your uh, private pilot license, you have to do a three leg um, trip, airport to airport to airport. And I, I left out of uh, West Chicago Airport in a little 152, which is like a little bug smasher, two seater. Yeah. And I flew to uh, Peoria, Illinois, which has a controlled airspace. So when you're outside that airspace, you have to call them on the radio to get permission to enter. And you tell them who you are, where you are, which, what you want to do. So they allowed me to come into that airspace, and then I lost my radios. Uh, the airplane was flying fine. So what we do then is you have to look for light gun signals from the tower. And, you know, they flash red, yellow, or pardon me, red, Some uh, kind green. of pattern. That, yes, yeah, okay. like so many flashes means this, do this, do that. So I, I remember uh, as a student pilot uh, just... Uh, reading all this stuff and learning all this stuff flew by the tower they went ting 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 gave me a couple of flashes i did a pattern came in and landed uh pulled up to a general aviation place jumped out called them on the uh, radio on the uh telephone and uh, wanted to know if i did anything wrong yeah. <laughs> you know did i do it right and then they go oh, yeah you're good you're good uh -huh. <laughs> so i guess if you can talk about it you're good yeah yeah no yeah, matter the consequences sure. So, yeah, so they, uh, they fixed my radio and then uh, continued on. But uh, as far as flying cargo out of Philadelphia, there was a few times where the weather wasn't so great, picking up icing. I've, I've had where uh, I had lost an alternator, and uh, uh, a good thing there was two on the airplane. But if I'd lost the last one, I was down to basically 30 minutes of battery power. And I remember I was flying Philly to Columbus, Ohio, and I was picking up ice, picking up ice. Uh, I'm checking the weather around in case the last alternator goes and everything is what they called walks off, meaning zero visibility. Uh, I mean, you can't see nothing. Right. You can't see nothing. So I'm thinking, man, this, this is not good. <laughs> so I'm picking up icing, and uh, I could see my airspeed deteriorating. And uh, we have these things called boots on the leading edge of our airplane that you push them out, it's supposed to break the ice off as it, as it builds. Well, I remember pushing the uh, pushing the button for the boots to push to knock the ice off, and what happened is the ice just moved out further. It didn't come off, so now my airspeed is depleting. And uh, when you pick up ice on an airplane, it kind of changes uh, the characteristics of the aircraft. As I would far imagine as lift. Yeah, and uh, and I thought, geez, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I have no place to land, no place to go. And if I lose this alternator, I'm down to 30 minutes to figure it out. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. Yeah. So anyway, um, I guess just through experience, uh, maybe a little help up above. Yeah. Uh, they said uh, I descended actually, and uh, where the air was a little bit more dense, and I hit the boots one more time, and I knocked off just enough ice 
off the uh, leading edge of the aircraft that I hobbled into Columbus, Ohio. I remember getting out of the airplane. I remember I landed as fast as I could because I didn't know what my stall speed was. So I just poured the coals to a nice long runway, landed, pull up to the uh, general aviation area, get out, look at the airplane. It's completely covered in ice. Oh, no. Yeah. So you were fortunate. I was, there was a little pucker factor in that one. <laughs> yeah, a little pucker you go factor. Change, change your pants. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, good thing I brought an extra set of underwear in that one. How long but, are you going to continue to fly? When are you going to retire? Well, actually, uh, the Federal Aviation's uh, regulations kick you out at 65, so I'm done. Oh, is that right? I'm done March 3rd oh, okay. uh, of this year. So, All right. So I'm forced into retirement. You've got your Indian motorcycle hat on, so that's give you a little bit more time to get some trips I, in, I, right? I see that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, more motorcycle trips. Um, I actually bought my parents' place up in Canada. Got some property up there on a lake, so I've been developing that for the last year and a half. So yeah. I think I'm going to split my time between here and Canada, and uh, a little more fishing, a little more hunting, good uh, motorcycling. Um, enjoy, get, enjoy I, the. If I can get through the, the honeydew list, yeah. maybe have to get a part-time job to get off the honeydew list. <laughs> I know. We'll get out of the house. Goes. Yeah, there we go. Well, Al, uh, I appreciate you coming today. We got yeah. our we got our game coming up this Sunday. Yes. Uh, we're playing the New York Rangers. Yeah, I'm looking um, forward to that. Yeah, we're gonna. The Stars are playing at two thirty. We're playing at uh, after the game, and so Rangers have uh, Ron Gresh. Greshner's coming, yep. uh, Duguay's coming. Kovalev, Stephen, I heard. Uh, Kovalev's coming, yeah. Adam Graves. Yeah. I got the list, Bass, Bobby Bass and our alumni guy sent it to me yesterday. Yeah. So you're going to do the little round table with us before uh, yes. noon, something like that. Yes. So we'll have a good time then. I appreciate you making the trek in. I know you're going to skate at noon today. Yes. And uh, we will see you, well, you know, I won't see you tonight, but we will see you on Saturday Same and day. Sunday. We're going to yes. have a little, a little get together at our alumni room okay. on uh, Saturday evening with the New York Rangers. And Maybe that's where we get a bit of an edge. Yes. <laughs> Maybe we can yes. abuse a I'm few work of those on guys. Kovalev. We'll grab the, We'll get the young guys. I'll bring some Herman Marshall and <laughs> some early go. bird gummies. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and maybe I'll just disperse a few of those to those guys. Yeah, so, again, down. Al, I, I appreciate it. you. had a hell of a career. You're a tough man when you played. Um, and, I, and I enjoy you coming in today and, and talking about this whole thing. So I appreciate you coming. All right. Out. Thanks for having All me. Right. I appreciate it. That's another one in the books. Thanks, folks.